you know, I mean, I guess you could turn it on that everybody's, mm-hmm. gonna, I guess, is here now. Um, so this is what I'd like to do today and, um, um, you know, maybe uh, next week uh, to get through the Section 78 through 83 and speak to that a little more, make some correlations to other parts of the, of the being in time, and then to go on to the, the section on being in history, which I think is very important for historiographic, you know, historiographic and historicity, what we call, and how Heidegger goes about that. And this is interesting that the first place that, that um, Derrida would begin his lectures on Heidegger are being in history, right? not being in time, the quiet section on time, even though he remarks on that, it really is the question of history. So, um, um, but yeah, so first of all, I thought, I thought the best thing to do is again, I, I know I did this at the beginning of the semester, I elaborated it a little more. I think this is important for multiple reasons. Uh, I'm gonna give you another diagram of Plato's theory of forms and the theory of knowledge. I think it's very important because of everything from Baju to Heidegger, I can refer you to a, um, a, a section of Baju's being an event called nature, right? My theme or poem, right? And uh, this is really a, a, a kind of reading of the divided line in Plato. Uh, and uh, and uh, also the play of light. And also that lethe, you know, from alethia, means you're getting away from this lethia, which in, in some ways is this, you know, very vague shadow-like existence, right? The hiddenness, right, is shadowy and, and vague in, in some ways. And the aletheia is the bringing the undisclosedness and the uncovering of this. But this is happening more poetically, not mathematically, as in Badiou, right, in a sense. So Heidegger's response to Badiou, I know we haven't read that here, but just to throw it out since Badiou is one of the you know, flavors of the day, so to speak, and considers himself, uh, you know, uh, as Bali Barra both affectionately and tongue-in-cheek calls him Chairman Badiou, um, is, uh, is uh, you know, considers himself to be the last great line of French philosophy, and I'm reading being an event as a kind of, you know, long polemic, if you will, and long interrogation of Heidegger's notion of being, but also using mathematical, you know, set theory, uh, critically set theory and forcing theory to do so. Um, uh, anyway, I mean, it may give us a little bit of insight to, to kind of locate, I mean, this is really intended diagram as location rather than, you know, um, uh, you know, a full, full understanding. Um, again, I, I always suggest that book, book uh, uh, seven, of the Republic is always worth reading. You know, it's really the educational model of the the academy, right? And what what is the philosopher to do? And this is a crucial text. It begins with an allegory, as I mentioned. Allegory is also alos agora, you know, the outside story or the other story that is told in the marketplace. You could talk about this as an early form of interpolation in the Althusserian sense where, you know, interpolation is first used, to my knowledge, to, by Tertullian, the Christian philosopher who, you know, uh, <laughs> does a lot with this, uh, you know, hey, you over there, you know, God wants you and this kind of stuff. So this is very interesting in terms of his discourses uh, back then. Althusser, of course, transforms it considerably to how we get interpolated by the ideological state apparatuses and how we're identified and how this becomes part of our day-to-day ideology and, you know, the political realms we inhabit. So anyway, let, let me do this. Again, it's a, it's a theory of perception, right? And I'll do a couple of riffs on it. Um, so um, think of it this way. So there's a source. And I'll do both. The source, right? The things. the um, modes and then the class, right? 
you can see early on, Plato is figuring out, he doesn't articulate it this, in this way, but this is of course gleaned from the theory of forms and the theory of knowing, right? So anyway, what we have here is a line, right, on the vertical axis. And we begin at A, there's B, and then in the middle there's something called the divided line that divides these, everything from the source and the things that are perceived, the modes and the classes, into, you know, above the line or below the line. Now, when Heidegger, I'm, I'm just going to make one short extension here, right? Heidegger and Junger is published as The Being Question, the Sein Fragen, Zor Sein Fragen, right? On the question of being or the being question is really on the line to how do we examine the line of our time, right? So this is a metaphor, if you will, in the text of philosophy, in the history of the text of philosophy, the, the line and the divided line that still plays out in the 20th century, you know, actively, very actively, and should play out in the 21st. Yeah, okay? So remember, Plato is articulating this in four, 375 BCE, right? This is after all the pre-Socratics, after Lao Tzu in China, right? After uh, Buddha <laughs> has appeared. So all of these moments are happening in the history of world philosophy, right? But this, he is the first to kind of systematize, if you will, a theory of knowledge, right, that is lasted, right, in our, in our culture and in our pedagogy, right, in, in many ways, right? Um, so, um, again, so the divided line, let's say, is C, and then there's a little thing called D, and then there's E, and the movement is from the cave to what Plato calls the good, what Badiou will call the true idea, and I think true idea, this is me speaking, but I think it's, you know, it could be argued very effectively, true idea to Badiou means the communist hypothesis, you know, ultimately, right? <laughs> that it's really the communist hypothesis up here. And the good in Plato, right, right, for, for, for Baju, you go through the oligarchy, monarchy, the democracy. Democracy is on the way to communism. It's the last stage before the, the communist in terms of the systems of government in his re rethinking of Plato. Mm -hmm. Plato is basically, you know, thinking through these systems too later in the, in the Republic in Books 8 and Books 9 in particular. Book 10 is, um, I mean, you know, I, I don't know if, I know we did this in the past, but, uh, you know, book one in Plato is a prologue, right? And it basically poses the question, the foundational question of modern political, you know, what is justice and if there is such a thing, is it useful, right? <laughs> As a concept, right? Right? So this becomes very, very important. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. stretching my legs because I gotta, still have a pretty bad pulled hamstring, so it's <laughs> kind of yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, so th this is, goes on in book one of the Republic. You know, two and three are really about the, the notion of the city, mm -hmm. the primitive city, into the society, into the city of, 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 of desire, right, into the luxurious city. And then books three and four are fundamentally concerned with what does the educational system look like. And the two models, of course, are the one level you have musicus, music and mathematics and the liberal arts, and the other side is the gymnast, gym, gymnastia, of which the warriors are a combination of both the gymnastics, right, mm -hmm. and the intellect, right, mm -hmm. and this is always being weighted, all right, so let me, uh, yeah, and then books, book five and six, about women, the role of the family, book six is also concerned with um, this theory of knowing, this is when the divided line is presented somewhat, and book seven begins to articulate the allegory of the cave, and the play of light in the cave, and you know, you know the story, right, that the prisoner one escapes, goes out, sees the light of day, comes back down into the cave. He can't see, his eyes are very dimmed, you know. He's kind of fending in the dark, actually being blinded by the light, mm -hmm. and then slowly begins to see. Then he tells his fellow people that they're not seen, 
what do they do? They kill them. You know, but basically a typical kind of thing that ignorance kills, right? Early, early model here of you know what ignorance does in the world, right? And uh, uh, and then Socrates and Glaucon have a discussion about whether or not you know the philosopher should go back down into the cave to educate the masses, so to speak, right? And this becomes a, a story for many many years. You know, of course. From Gramsci, you know, and from other readings, the Jesuits were the great educators of the, you know, mm -hmm. Counter Reformation, right? They were created as the SJs in order to counter the Lutheran Calvinist moment, right? And the Quakers, of course, and, uh, you know, also confront the Franciscans and the Dominicans within their own ranks, right? So the Jesuits became a very powerful control mechanism pedagogically of the simple people, right? Even though they taught well. They taught mathematics, they taught science, they taught, you know, the literary, etc. They taught the classics. They taught very well, but it was always under a kind of ideological model of control, right? That this is really to control the simple, keep them in their place, and make sure everything is unified under the armature, the organism called the church, right? Which also meant the state, especially if you read, you know, the de' Medici family as the most powerful family at that time in terms of having both popes and princes in one, right? And how this, you know, transformed Europe. Descartes himself was educated by the Jesuits at La Fleche. And one of the radical moves that Descartes makes, in my, in my view, is that he throws off all this Jesuit training that's worthless. You know, I mean, but he gives good reasons in the discourse on the method. Very good, and you know, we, you know, et cetera. And to build a, a modern epistemology. That's what Descartes' doing. So there's a revolution in thinking going on with the Cartesian way. And Heidegger's well, well aware of this, as is Adorno and the the book that we looked at, the introduction to, to dialectics. So anyway, I'm, I'm doing this for you know reason because I think this is very important, you know, both for pedagogical reasons, but also very important to kind of understand how we get to this point in modern philosophy, you know, of this kind of domination of the quest for certainty, scientific objectivity, and at the same time, how you know a debate begins about you know energy and poetics versus energy and mathematics, right? What is more powerful in terms of giving us, you know, being as history, right? Being as epochality. So I'm going to do multiple things here, and please stop me if it's, if it's too uh, too much, right? But but anyway, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the Republic ends with the worlds of um, fate, essentially the that story of Ur, I think. Myth of Ur. Myth of Ur. E e e -R. And that kind of plays out in Heidegger, too, actually, with fate right. and destiny and all right, that Right, he well. does. He, he actually models a lot of this on the old, the reading of the ancients. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in some ways, that platonic moment comes back to him, although he considers himself certainly more Aristotelian than platonic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't get this and you don't get the myth. See, the, the, there, of course, an a immense amount of scholarship about myth in Plato. Mm -hmm. Is it used as irony? Mm -hmm. Is it real? What is the function of it? Mm -hmm. So th this, of course, becomes another, you know, example. But yes, no, that's well put. Fate, fate, destiny. And, you know, for Heidegger, uh, history is destiny right. and fate. It's ascending. Geschick. He plays on Schicksa <laughs> and Geschichte in the German language, and unfortunately we don't have, but I'll, I'll try to do it in an elementary way. You know, he's playing on 